Okay, folks. So we can get started. <laughs> Um, how's the pendulum wrapping up for people? <laughs> Seems mostly okay. Um, one thing, so so I'm seeing a lot of balancing pendulums. One of the common symptoms that I'm seeing in a, in a mostly balanced pendulum is it stands up. We can knock it in one direction and it catches itself. We knock it in the other direction and it sort of saturates and falls over. I have a suspicion to what that's about. I, I think, I have to experiment with this to confirm whether or not this is the case, but I think that that may be related to the fact that these motors have a pretty large hysteresis region. So if the motor is sitting straight up here and you're sending it a non-zero PWM signal so that it is, uh, it is not receiving enough duty cycle to actually turn yet, but if you were to increase the duty cycle just a little bit, it would start turning in that direction. I believe it's the case that that the direction where you're sort of set up to just about start spinning, that's the direction where it will catch itself. However, if you knock it in the other direction, the PWM, the, the duty cycle decreases out of the one input to the H bridge, increases through the hysteresis region to the other part of the H bridge. And by the time it starts spinning, it may be too late. I, I think that's what's causing this, but I have to confirm that. Um, I can I can imagine some somewhat sort of hacky solutions to maybe trying to overcome that, popping yourself through that hysteresis region. That's probably going to be, if you were to, to undertake that sort of tuning, that tuning would I believe be specific to each of your motors independently. They probably each have slightly different hysteresis characteristics. Um, so because that's that's introducing a lot of trickiness, if I see a balancing pendulum, and I can smack it with a pencil in one direction and it catches itself. In terms of getting a checkout, that's sufficient. And then with some more tweaking and tuning, you can get it to balance even better. I saw one group. Are Mahmoud in bed here, by chance? I don't think so. Um, I saw one group that got this to balance, I don't know, maybe 50 times better than, <laughs> than I ever did. Um, so it is doable. Um, they're, they're, this particular group's pendulum, I thought that they had screwed the thing in really tight and were playing a joke on me, and it was just standing straight up. Then you whack it, and it goes zhoop, straight back up. Really impressive. So it's, it's doable with this system, but boy, is it tricky, because you know, these noise are not incredibly, or these motors are not incredibly high fidelity motors. You know what I mean? So it's, it introduces these real world problems. Those of you that got it balancing, did folks find the dithering to be helpful or harmful? Harmful? Did anyone find it helpful? Okay, getting thumbs down here, thumbs down, sort of medium. Okay, so that's a good lesson learned. When I was experimenting with this, I found it necessary for getting my system to balance. But what we're sort of discovering in lab is that for a lot of groups, it's introducing more instability than stability. So again, something I need to think about. Bruce? Do you think that the uh, dithering was taking it through the hysteresis region? I think it was, or something, yeah. Um, any other bugs that folks would like to talk about related to the pendulum? Were there any, did any, yeah, did you have one? Um, it was kind of a dithering. So at least, so our dithering was like in our, um, interrupt that, that calculated like all the values from the IMU and gyroscope at least it seemed like it was updating like way too fast for the ring so like if there's any delay yeah it would kind of like really change our value okay okay did anyone find any tricks were required to get the thing to work right you want to implement anything yeah so we had this really weird issue where like no matter, like, even if it was offset by a little bit, um, it would go to like almost a full duty cycle. And so we like try to implement some things anyways. We ended up deciding that like, if the duty cycle was, um, I don't know why this worked, but like if the duty cycle was like under a certain, certain threshold, we would just like 
not said anything. Huh. Did that reduce quivering? Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, it was like the it was like the quivering and the, it was super super jittery. Okay. So to reduce that, we set the like a certain threshold that it had to surpass in order to start. Okay. Okay. Um, a couple of other common bugs that I'll remark on for for most folks, you're through the checkout, so this isn't you know necessarily relevant for a lab, but it might be relevant for building more things in the future. Um, one of the common bugs that I saw, and I mentioned this once in lecture, but I'll mention it again because I continued to see it, was we look at your complementary filter output. So you were plotting it on the VGA screen. And the arm would be tilted this direction. We grab it and move it to the other side. What you expect to see on the output of the complementary filter is the angle track in real time where that arm is. What we instead saw was the complementary angle briefly went the opposite direction than it was supposed to. And then sort of slowly in a low passy kind of way approach the correct angle. The reason for this is the, the through holes through which you're putting the screws on the IMU allows for you to put the IMU on in either direction. So the code assumes that the accelerometer is in a particular orientation and you may have installed the accelerometer upside down as far as the code is concerned. So that the angle that you're calculating for the accelerometer is the opposite sign than the angle that you're computing for the gyroscope. And because you're, you're of the, these relative weights between the gyroscope information and the accelerometer information, what we saw as a consequence in the complementary filter output was this weird thing where you'd move the arm and ultimately the, the you would end up with an angle measurement that looked correct, but it would take a while to get there and it would sort of deviate in the opposite direction first. The, the solution to this problem incidentally was in the line of the complementary filter where you're computing the accelerometer angle, it's just to put to mi a minus sign in front of it. And then the whole, the whole problem was solved. Um, that was one problem I saw a bunch of times. There was another one that I just had on the tip of my tongue. What was it? Oh, it was. So in the, on the web page that describes the, the recommended order of operations by which you tune this thing, I have some recommended parameter values for things like KP, KI, and KD. What I should include on that web page and that I didn't is the sign of those parameter values assumes a particular convention for which direction is positive angles and which direction is negative angles. And either convention is fine, right? You can say that this is positive and this is negative or opposite and what, whatever, that's either works. But there has to be agreement. You, you have to be consistent in the convention that you've chosen. So one of the other bugs that I saw a whole bunch of times was system wouldn't balance and it would feel like it was deliberately not balancing. Like you try to get it to the right angle and it would go, no, and, and sort of pull itself off to the side. So the, the process by which we would debug that is to eliminate contributions for the, to the PID controller down just to the proportional control. So we just have KP on and we turn it up quite high so that we can really feel its effect and then gently grab the pendulum arm and move it back and forth through the vertical. If the sign on your KP is correct, what you will feel is that you approach the vertical the motor is going to be spinning in one direction. And then when you pass through the vertical, it will start spinning in the other direction. If you have the signs correct, what you'll feel when that motor switches direction is it tries to catch at the top. It, it resists you moving it past the vertical. You can really feel this if you turn the KP up high. If you have the sign wrong, what you'll feel instead is that you approach the vertical. And when the motor switches direction, it pulls it through the vertical. And that's an indication that there's a inconsistency in the in there's an inconsistency between the controller and the convention that you've chosen to use for which direction is positive and negative for the angles. So again, it's a simple fix. You just change the sign on your KP, KI, and KD, and then it just works. Um, but there were a handful of groups that debugged this for hours and hours and hours. And what we ultimately ended up discovering is that they'd accidentally made a pendulum destabilizer. <laughs> which is not, not going to work. Um, again, a simple fix, but a common bug. Okay, did I miss any? 
I think I mentioned this last time, but one, <coughs> one, um, one way to add information that some groups found very helpful for, to debugging is to, on the VGA screen where you're displaying the low pass PID controller output, to plot the, the P term, the I term, and the D term separately so that you can see the separate contributions from each term of the PID controller. And then as you move things around, you can see the relative importance of each of these terms. Um, some folks found that very useful because they would discover things like, oh, one term of the PID controller is just absolutely dominating the others, which suggests that maybe one of the gains is off by an order of magnitude or something. So it, it helped with debugging those sorts of situations. So if you're still working on this, that's a relatively simple thing to add to your display. And you might find it really helpful. Not to mention, it's just really interesting to watch how the controller sort of changes as the thing tries to balance. Yeah. I mean, some bugs with overflowing fix 15, um, because fix 15 only goes to plus or minus 32,000. So specifically with D, if you try to set that like really high, A wouldn't work. And then we were having issues with if your error goes too high, it would start oscillating between both sides because you're overflowing and then rounding to either plus 5,000 or minus 5,000. So it switched directions as you went over. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's a good catch. And you can fix that by just making the data type like long, long instead of in. Okay. Okay. Anything else from anyone? I know there's a handful of you still finishing up today, but what do people think of this lab? <laughs> You're not going to give me an honest answer here. Um, maybe I'll put up an anonymous Google form and you can tell me what you think of this lab. Um, what, what I mean by that is, um, you know, these labs, they're, they're difficult to calibrate until we actually run them. And um, I'll be interested, I'll figure out some sort of mechanism by which I can get feedback from you all on what you think. Your lab reports can be one of them. You know, you can be honest in these lab reports, but I know that sometimes if your name's attached to the feedback, people are a little bit hesitant. Uh, what I'm really curious to learn is just, is it too, too hard or is it um, the right amount of hard? That's the kind of thing I'm sort of hoping to figure out. Yeah. If you had moved some of the check off one stuff to the second lab, it would have been the, the, the first, okay, the first week stuff. If the serial monitor stuff was in the second week, it might have been a little bit more balanced. Did you think the second week was, was particularly intense or the first week was particularly intense? So the first week was more intense if you couldn't build circuits. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Like, let's say if you didn't connect your ground for like two hours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. um, I think this lab definitely had a more mechatronic flavor than some of the others, which is a positive thing. Yeah. Um, I think the only thing I feel like that's always tricky with PIDs is just that it's not a hit or miss, but it's like either you tune it and it takes 30 minutes or it takes three hours or 10 hours. Yes. And that's, you know, the, this final lab every semester, the one that's sort of robotics flavored, they tend to have this property where the amount of time that it takes to get it to working can be really variable among groups. And it's because this is a lab where we're actually having to deal with things like physics, right? And so the whole, because we have allowed for the universe to sort of enter into our debugging environment, things get a lot more complicated. So that's just, I mean, part of it is the nature of the project, right? That's just the nature of building robotics, these sorts of things as we have to deal with this sort of debugging environment. That said, I don't want to make it too crazy for a three week project. So in any case, I'll, I'll figure out a mechanism by which folks can give their thoughts on this. Um, okay, anything else with the pendulum? If not, what I want to do today is continue what we've been doing, which is sort of treating some special topics that will be that I, I have um, That I think will be relevant to many of you based on the final project proposals that I've seen. And so what I want to talk about today is uh, a few methods for audio synthesis that sort of allow, they allow for you to create sounds that are more exotic and more complicated in a frequency sense than just direct digital synthesis, which you're all familiar with. I want to talk about that. And then I also want to talk about um, a convoluted somewhat convoluted mechanism by which you might do things like voice recognition. 
by which I mean recognizing one person's voice as being from this person and this other person's voice as being from this person, not recognizing the words that they're saying, not extracting that information, but just identifying it as partner number one, partner number two, or partner number three. There's a strategy for doing that that's sort of twisted, but we'll talk through that as well. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about, however, is FM synthesis, which I briefly mentioned a couple lectures ago. Let me just remind you that a couple lectures ago, I was talking about the various mechanisms by which you might produce music. And I said that you essentially have three options. Um, one of those options is to do spectral matching, where what you do is you record the instrument or the sound that you're trying to replicate. So you have an, you know, all the data, you record it with a microphone. And then you do a frequency analysis on that data to figure out for you know, this time slice to this time slice to this time slice, what are the dominant frequencies present in this sound? You would discern that by looking at the FFT, figuring out which bins have the spikes, where's most of the power in here. And then you would, you would analyze how the relative amplitude of those spikes changes and perhaps the location of those spikes change. Right? It could be the case that the modes sort of move as the sound progresses. And then what you would do is you'd say, okay, you know, the, uh, the four or the five or the eight loudest frequencies that I see in this sound that I'm trying to replicate, I'm going to set up a direct digital synthesis synthesizer that synthesizes that particular frequency at the amplitude that I see in the recording of the actual instrument or sound that what it is I'm trying to record. And then you run them all and what you get is a pretty good approximation of whatever it is that you're trying to emulate. Last time I played that, that simulation of the Cornell bell, it sounds pretty darn good. So that particular strategy, um, it has the advantage of being sort of um, simple in the sense that it's easy to understand what you're doing, right? So the idea is basically we have this tool, direct digital synthesis, that allows for us to synthesize pure frequencies. We look at which are the loudest frequencies apparent in this sound and their decay rates, and we deploy this strategy to just synthesize those, those frequencies, and there you go, right? And it just works. Gathering the data required to actually get that to work can be challenging, right? Because you, have to, you, you, you can imagine that, you know, you record this sound, you then have to go through this process of deciding, okay, over what time periods am I going to look at the FFT? How many modes am I going to try to capture in my simulation? How am I going to try to model the decay rates? There's a lot of information that you have to extract from the actual recording in order to generate a simulation that is passable. Again, totally doable, but it just, it takes some work to gather that data. Um, the second option is the one that I want to start with talking, uh, talking about today is FM synthesis. FM synthesis is, um, so in lab one, we used an algorithm called direct digital synthesis to synthesize a pure sine wave. So that is to say a sine wave with a single frequency. And then what we discovered is that by modulating the amplitude of that pure frequency, you can generate simulations of some real things. In lab one, we did crickets, right? The, the, the sound that the cricket was generating was just a pure tone, 2300 hertz, but we were modulating it on and off to match the pattern of a real cricket. And as a consequence, you get a really nice simulation of a cricket. You can play with that amplitude modulation of a pure tone to simulate some other things. So for instance, say you, 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 you uh, generate a pure tone and you ramp it up really quickly and then decay it quite slowly. So you, know, you have this envelope that looks maybe like this and inside your tone is wiggling. What you'll get out is something that sounds like, like depending on the frequency you're synthesizing, you can get pretty nice simulations of struck bells little bells, high frequency bells, um, things like that. Maybe a cowbell, you can get a pretty nice simulation of a cowbell just by modulating the amplitude of a pure tone. What FM synthesis allows for you to do is not only modulate the amplitude of the sine wave that you're generating, but also modulate the frequency of the sine wave that you're generating so that over the course of the sound, the, the pitch is actually changing. So, the, the, a resource that I want to direct you to for some examples of how this works are on the previous course webpage here for the PIC32. Anybody found this link yet? 
Okay, there's really good stuff on this website. Folks might find it useful. In particular, if we scroll down, one of Bruce's web pages is down here called Sound Synthesis. And there's a section down here on FM Sound Synthesis. Um, the, the example code that's included on this web page is for the PIC32, but it's all just C. So you can mostly just port it to the RP2040. The only thing that you have to change is the stuff associated with the SPI transactions. You just have to translate that over to the RP2040. But algorithmically, of course, it all translates. And the central notion here is that you can see it up there that the um, underneath the, the words, the basic waveform equation is the notion here is that instead of synthesizing our wave as some envelope times a sine function, some envelope times sine of our main frequency times time, right? That's what direct digital synthesis allows for us to do. The envelope, in our case, in lab one, the envelope looked like this. It was ramp up, sustain, ramp down. And then the sine wave had a frequency of 2300 hertz. Instead of just doing that, we, we put a sine wave in our sine wave, <laughs> essentially. So we say, we are going to synthesize a wave with some overarching envelope. And then the sine wave that that envelope is, is modulating has some main frequency plus some separate FM envelope times a second sine wave with its own frequency. So the notion here is we're synthesizing a sine, some carrier wave, some sine wave of a, of a frequency, but then that second term is, is modulating that frequency with, an, with uh, the distance over which it modulates is a knob that you can turn, and the frequency that it modulates that is also a knob that you can turn. The other knobs that you can turn include the shape of each of those envelopes. Maybe those envelopes have the same shape. Maybe they have different shapes. Maybe the relative amplitudes are different. So there's a handful of degrees of freedom here that you can turn. You could incidentally make these literal knobs in a synthesizer, right? So that you can actually change all these parameters in real time. And the sound that you get out of an FM synthesizer as you turn these knobs is really hard to predict, actually, <laughs> which makes it deeply addicting to play with. So if any of you are building synthesizers, and I know some of you are, depending on the flavor of synthesizer that you want to build, you might consider at least having an FM synthesis mode wherein the user can go in and via some mechanism, maybe it's potentiometers, maybe it's some sort of other interface, play with these parameters and just see the sounds that come out. So I have a, sh a little demo here that I'm going to run where the code that's running on this RP2040, the only knob that I will be turning here is FFM. So, you know, you know there's, a, there's a whole bunch of degrees of freedom here. I am synthesizing a, a pure sine wave, so I'm not modulating its amplitude, of 262 hertz, which is about middle C. And then I am modulating that that sine wave with another sine wave for which I have a user interface for changing the, um, the modulating frequency. So let, let me just, it's easier if I just show you. So this is just pure, that's just a pure 262 hertz middle C. I'm gonna add some FM to this. So let's see, let's modulate that first of all with a slower sine wave. So I'm going to modulate this with another sine wave that's, let's say, one hertz. Five hertz. Right, so that, that's just playing with one, one parameter. There's a number of parameters, but you get a bunch of crazy sounds out of it. The other interesting thing you can do is, so the, the uh, main frequency that we're synthesizing here is 262 hertz. Let's have our modulating frequency be an integer multiple of that. So let's see, 262 times two is 524. So let's modulate it with a 524 hertz wave. You generate kind of a nice sound, actually. It kind of sounds good. 
Let's see. Let's do it with a third here. 786. Kind of sounds pleasant. And then you can find other, if we choose to modulate it at a frequency where there is a, not such a nice relationship between the two frequencies, you can generate beat patterns as well. Let me see, what would be, you know, like 37? Not a great example. In any case, probably what I'm showing you evidence of is, I could, I could stand up here for the rest of the lecture and just punch different numbers in here and see what comes out because <laughs> it's really hard to, to predict what it's going to be. Let's do a really high frequency. How about 2,000? Just a little bit of high pitch stuff there. Do you detect that? Let's see. Uh, 1,000. So, instrument that's like, again, it's made of you could make an uh, a user interface that allows for you to modify the main frequency, to modify the envelope if you cared to. You could modify the envelope of the, of the modulating sine wave, and you could also modify the frequency of the modulating sine wave. All that I'm modifying in this demo is the frequency of the modulating sine wave, and we're getting all kinds of crazy things coming out of this thing. Right? So you can imagine that the diversity of sounds that you can generate using this particular method is huge. And if you explore this space a little bit, you can find stuff that sounds, let's see. So that's, that's one of Bruce's examples, but that is, a consequence, I believe, Bruce, of just kind of exploring this space until you find a combinations where you go, oh, that kind of sounds like a string, right? And the, the sort of um, rigorous mathematical connection between this set of parameters and the physics that describe a string is non-existent, really. It's just, you know, you explore this space and you find parameter values where you go, oh, that kind of sounds reminiscent of this instrument. And you go, okay, that's going to be my emulation of the instrument. And then maybe you explore it some further and you find, you know, a different combination that maybe sounds vaguely drum-like. Right, and then, you know, you explore it more and you can also find stuff that's just like, what the hell is that? You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's, it's, a, you are, you are, um, it's fun to build things that can surprise you, right? It's fun to build things with this property where the thing that you've built can surprise even you, the person that built the thing. This has that property, which is kind of nice. I think Boyd's kind of has that property. If you can play with the parameters in Boyd's, it can surprise you, the stuff that it does. This too will surprise you with the sounds that it generates. Um, and there's some example code here that describes how to do this. I can also, if folks are interested, post the example code that's just doing this, this simpler synthesis. So that is the second method for um, generating sounds. As I said, the first one was spectral matching. The second one you might consider FM synthesis. By the way, there could be more than three, but th these are the, th the three that occur to me. The third one is um, physical simulation. And that method involves looking at the instrument that you want to emulate. Maybe it's a guitar or a violin or a non-stringed instrument. Maybe it's a drum. Maybe it's some sort of more bizarre thing. And you come up with the equation of motion for the system that you're trying to simulate. In the case of maybe a plucked guitar, that would be the wave equation, the 1D wave equation with fixed boundary conditions, right? At some point in your career here, you have studied this equation, right? So you can write down that equation, you can numerically integrate it, and you can put, you know, as you do that numeric integration, you put the amplitude of perhaps the center node in that string out through the DAC. And what you better hear is something that sounds like a string because you are literally simulating a string. 
And for the case of a string, there is a shortcut actually, the Karplus strong algorithm. Let's see here. Karplus strong string synthesis. This is the notion here, and if I get any of this wrong, Bruce, you can perhaps correct me, is this will generate sounds that sound very, very, very much like a plucked string. The way that you do it is you generate a bunch of white noise and you put it into this feedback system where what you are doing is you're, you're taking the noise burst. You're first of all sending it out through the output, but then each sample that you send out through the output goes through a delay channel, which is essentially a shift register. So you're, you're popping the most recent sample into the bottom of this shift register and popping the oldest one out the top of it. So it's pop, 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 pop. That's entering a low pass filter with a, um, with a gain that is less than one in order to keep this whole thing stable. And then the output of this filter gets fed back into what continues to come in from this noise burst. And if you can believe it, what comes out sounds a lot like a string. And in fact, it has been shown, I believe, that this is a solution to the 1D wave equation. This system describes a solution to that equation. So it is actually, it is actually a no kidding physical simulation of a string. It just looks not like that at all. But it's a great trick because this algorithm is dead simple to implement on a, on a microcontroller. It costs very little CPU. So you could generate lots and lots of strings. You could have a whole orchestra being synthesized. And each of the strings that you were synthesizing, you would be doing an actual physical simulation of that string being plucked. It's kind of interesting. The original implementation of this ran in real time on an 8-bit microcontroller at one megahertz clock rate. You have a thousand times more processor than that. A really good one to know if you're interested in music synthesis stuff. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, um, so with the FM, um, I guess, can you, if you, let's say we want to synthesize three FMs, which is an arbitrary number out there. Um, to play all three, you would have to have three um, speakers, correct? You couldn't just like add them together. That wouldn't like work properly. I mean, like it would be like quote unquote the same, but then that way you can heal the harmony if there is one. You can, you can add these things together in software. And so long as they don't collectively overflow the range of values that the DAC is able to accept, you can kick them all out through the speaker and you will hear all of them. So for instance, you know, you could set up two direct digital synthesis synthesizers in your code. So your interrupt service routine now contains two, one synthesizing 262 Hertz. The other one is synthesizing twice that you add the two together, make sure that they don't sum to a number that's greater than the DAC is willing to accept and send that value out to the DAC. And uh, you will hear both tones. If you were to do an FFT on the output waveform, what you would see is a big old spike at 262 hertz and a big old spike at the other frequency that you're generating. So indeed, you can, that's additive synthesis. You add up a whole bunch of sine waves and kick them all out, and then you hear all of them. Yeah. How much extra time would we have for calculations? Um, before the audio like fidelity like drops. So the answer depends on the rate at which you're synthesizing audio. Um, so in lab one, we were synthesizing at, I believe, 40 kilohertz. How low could you get that and get away with it? Do you know, Bruce? If you want to go down to AM radio bandwidth, which probably none of you are familiar with, but say telephone bandwidth would be three kilohertz bandwidth. So you'd say eight kilohertz synthesis rate is about the minimum you can have for any kind of reasonable music. I would say 16 sounds a lot better, and then 40 sounds a little better. Other questions? 
Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about, and I'm actually going to use the chalkboard for this because uh, there's a lot of steps to write down. <laughs> yeah. I did, port the, I did port the FM stuff to the RP2040 also. Put a user interface on it. So if you, uh, if somebody's interested in that, I'll point you to the right page that has the, who's it? A deterministic decay rate, which is important. Um, and there's also a web page that we can point you to that describes the Sepstrom stuff that I'm about to describe as well. So, so the last thing that I want to talk about is there were, I believe, two groups um, that both proposed projects that had an element of classification based on audio input to it. I think one group was hoping to classify one group member versus another group member based on um, audio heard by the microphone as the user was speaking. There was another group that was talking about instrument classification. And I'm curious if this would, I don't know if what I'm about to describe would work for this or not, but it certainly might. So what we're really after here in order to do something like this for, for people's sake is we're trying to find something in data gathered from the microphone that is unique to a person. And what exactly that is, is non-trivial, but one of the things that's unique to, relatively unique from person to person to person is the precise shape and form of our throat and mouth and such, right? So as we speak, part of the, um, part of the information in the waveform that comes out that we speak comes from the act, our actual anatomy, which is relatively unique from person to person to person. The other information that comes out is from like our vocal cords. And you know, that sort of information is a little bit, well, what can you get from that? The fundamental frequency of the person's voice perhaps, but you know, there are a lot of people with approximately the same fundamental frequencies. So classification based on that is harder. In some cases that could work. If you're trying to classify say, you know, your voice and a six year old's voice, the six year old's voice, fun the, their fundamental is way higher than yours. So you may be able to classify based on that. But if we're talking about a couple of adults, it's a little bit harder. So what we want is some strategy that allows for us to get rid of the information that doesn't help us classify one person from another person, but retain this information that comes from the stuff that makes our particular sound unique. And we're going to do so by generating what's called a sepstrum. Let me write that down. Sepstrum which is a reorganization of the word spectrum. This whole, the, everything I'm about to describe is uh, almost tongue in cheek. <laughs> like some of the names feel almost like they're little jokes, but we're gonna compute a, a, a spectrum, which as we'll see is sort of the spectrum of a spectrum. And this is what we are going to use to try to classify one person versus another person. So let me just write down let me warn you, I'm going to be waving my hands at this because I'm going to describe this to the level of depth that I understand right now, which is mm, like this much below surface level. So I'm just warning you now. But here are the process that, here's the process you might go through to try to identify different people. The first thing that you would do is gather microphone data as usual. Um, just like you did in lab one, right? So you're just, you have an ADC channel turned on, you're sampling at some rate, you're gathering a batch of audio samples. We're gonna, we're gonna do an FFT on this, but the first thing that we're going to do is window that data. You did this also in lab one. Remember that the FFT is making a low level assumption that the data on which it's operating is periodic. The way that we enforce that is we, we smoothly zero the data at its edges. Typically, we, we, the, the functions that do this are called windowing functions. There's a whole family of them that have different sort of um, consequences on the frequency that you get out. The one that we used was a Han window, which is essentially the top half of a cosine wave. But in any case, we window the data. We high pass the data. It doesn't have to be any kind of fancy 
filter here. We can do a digital high pass filter. But what we're doing here is somewhat attenuating the information down in sort of the vocal range here and increasing the relative importance of the higher frequency stuff where the information that we care about, as it turns out, actually tends to live. So we're high passing the data. The next thing that we do is an FFT. Again, still familiar from lab one. So we just computed an FFT. We are going to do a, uh, we're going to compute the magnitude of that FFT. Just like in lab one. In lab one, we use that alpha max beta min algorithm to optimize that step a little bit. But just recall that the output of the FFT is a complex number, has a real part and an imaginary part. In this step, we are computing the magnitude of those complex numbers. So root sum of squares of the real plus imaginary part. Okay. So, so far, all this is pretty much familiar except for the high pass step, but there's nothing particularly mysterious about that, really. Just move up. Yeah. There's a switch on the side. Ah, thank you. Front board down. Okay. The next thing that we do. Is so, so by the way, once we've gotten here, this is a hour spectrum. I'm going to put an arrow here because there's a, another step that you might consider injecting for speech recognition in particular. I'm going to come back to that. Mel spectrum. Um, the next thing that we're going to do is take the log, log of power spectrum. Why? <laughs> Why take the log of the power spectrum? OK, my hand wavy explanation for this is in the power spectrum, what we're seeing is a convolution of vocal information and information that comes from our anatomy, which incidentally is called formants, formant, something like that. When we take the, and those are, those are convolved, which means some sort of like a multiplicative relationship. By taking the log here, we are modifying the information such that that convolution becomes an addition. So that those two contributions are separate in, they are additively combined instead of convolved now by taking the log here. Okay. Now we're going to do something very strange which is take the FFT of that. So we took the FFT. We used the FFT to compute the power spectrum. We took the log of that power spectrum and then took the FFT of that. This is the sepstrom. By the way, another fun piece of vocab. The uh, units for the power spectrum here is frequency. The units for the sepstrum here are quefrency. <laughs> it's actually, it's, a, it's time here. It's, it's, a, it's a unit of time that's slightly different from the units of time that we started with, but it is units of time in the quefrency. OK. So we've taken the FFT of a power spectrum. What is this showing us? It's showing us something like the periodicity of the modes in our voice. Periodicity of the modes in our voice. That is somewhat unique from person to person to person. What we then do is low pass that. And this can be a dirty low pass, by which I mean, basically, we took the FFT here, right? The output of that FFT um, is going to be you know, a whole bunch of bins. We essentially chop off the top part of the bins, just throw them away. So we're just keeping the lower bins here. You may be getting ready to say this, but the, the, the top bins have the information about the pitch of the vocal 
records, but no information about the person. So you're throwing that away. But if you wanted to pitch, it's there. What we then do, step nine here, is inverse FFT. Uh, the low pass to FFT of the FFT. So inverse FFT, that from step eight. And what you're going to get as a consequence of this is if, if you're, uh, you know, suppose your power spectrum, you know, they typically have a look that's like, you know, some crazy kind of spiky thing. What you get at the out put here is a really smooth power spec power spectrum output and the the classifying information here is the shape of this so then in order to identify one person from another person what you would do is something like maybe maybe you're doing peak finding here and trying to identify people based on the locations of the peaks or maybe you're doing some sort of more general shape detection here so that you can, you can classify people based on the shape of this smoothed spectrum here. And the little arrow that I put here as perhaps being necessary is converting this to a MEL spectrum, which is just to say taking the bins of your FFT and clumping the information from, from sections of adjacent bins together and the clumps get bigger as you go up the spectrum in a logarithmic sense as, as some of you may be aware your sensitivity to sound is logarithmic in nature and so that maps the information contained in that fft to a scale that's a little bit more um human kind of specific in a sense uh takes it from a from linear separation on that FFT output to a something more akin to a logarithmic separation among the bins. Uh, it can help with identifying people. Mel is short for melody, I believe. So it's related to the word melody. So, so all doable in the RP2040. And in fact, if I'll, we can point you to some web pages where Bruce has been experimenting with doing this sort of thing. Um, the experiments I believe you were running, Bruce, was using this method to identify different vowel sounds. Ah, uh, e, o. Oh. You'd say that, and it would say, you know, they're saying ah, uh, they're saying e, they're saying o. Oh. But you could use this method to try to identify one person from another person. Uh, this works specifically with voice because you have a fairly low number of modes from your throat. Your throat produces about between three and five dominant modes. And I don't know that it would work for an instrument. It would be interesting to find out. Mm -hmm. I Googled around a little bit and I, I had not seen, maybe I just didn't look hard enough, but I hadn't seen this deployed for instrument classification, which is not to say it's not doable. I just didn't, couldn't find any resources on it. Not exactly an intuitive series of steps. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to understand number six, taking the log of the spectrum. Are you like going from frequency, like to go from frequency of time, you would like integrate whatever you have, like e to the, whatever the Fourier reverse thing is. Um, why are you, why the log? Like, what are you doing with that? So the, the ex excitation, your vocal cords, is convolved with the filter function in the usual linear filter fashion, right? So if you have convol convolution in the time domain, that's multiplication in the frequency domain. So since you've taken the FFT, you're now in the frequency domain. So if you take the log, it turns that multiplication, the convolution multiplication into an addition, and then you can subtract a piece of it, which is the excitation. So it's still frequency, like the units would be frequency. Log frequency. Okay. It's unitless. So when you take the FFT of that, how does that become like a time? Like, I'm just confused. Like, well, how it's like an inverse transform, right? The inverse transform of frequency is a time. And so this is kind of a uh, 
time life <laughs> in a spooky Halloween sense. Because you're taking an FFT again. But it's not, it's not the same units of time. Yeah. And maybe that's the nature of the confusion. You're not getting back to like seconds. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a time unit that's different now. Okay. So we're out of time. I'll be in lab this afternoon. And um, yeah, I'll see the rest of you on Monday. <laughs>